And evergreens are also wonderful for us in landscapes, especially because they stop those winter winds. That's why we're, they're so popular. But also they provide nice beauty all year round. They pr give us privacy. They're very useful in the home landscape. And we're really fortunate tonight to have an expert on evergreens with us tonight. Greg Morganson is a woody ornamentals researcher out of NDSU here in Fargo. He's one of the leading woody ornamental researchers in the Midwest. He's got a lot of great practical knowledge for us. And he's going to share with us the best evergreens, or sometimes referred to as conifers more technically, properly, uh, the best conifers from North Dakota. So let's welcome Greg. OK, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I, I said conifers because not all evergreens are conifers. You have broadleaf evergreens, you've got rhododendrons, boxwoods. So when we talk about, when I talk about conifers, I usually talk about, or evergreens, I talk about conifers, which are evergreen type trees. So as I mentioned, I work with the uh, NDSU Woody Plant Improvement Program. I work with Dr. Todd West, who uh, replaced Dale Herman after Dale retired. And uh, we've just kind of taken off from that and, and kept the program growing and, and on to uh, new and higher things, I guess. So with that, uh, if I could have the lights over here. Um, if any of you or how many of you have been out to the Absaraka Horticulture Research Farm, uh, we have an open house every year. I'd certainly encourage you to come out as you come in the gate. We've got uh, what we call what used to be the dwarf conifer and mixed conifer planting. They're, some of them are getting fairly tall, but we have uh, many, many uh, deciduous and coniferous plants planted at the Amsaraka uh, Research Farm that are there pretty much for people to view. Uh, why conifers or evergreens? And um, pretty much North Dakota, we go seven months without a leaf on a tree. So it's nice to have conifers in our landscapes. Uh, they give us colors year-round, uh, many green, of course, the blues of uh, Colorado spruce. And then even some of the arborvita and uh, some of the other conifers have a yellow to gold foliage on them too. So it provides winter color for us. They provide a backdrop for uh, smaller growing plants. A lot of plants do well in the protection of larger plants, perennials, small shrubs. So they, they work well in that area. Uh, hedges and screenings, uh, nosy neighbors, you can put a arborvita hedge in there and you'll, you'll never know they're over there. And they can be utilized in many forms. We think of a conifer as a large tree, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And, but they come in very, very many forms. Pyramidal, columnar, weeping. Some are shrubs and some are low ground cover. So there's, there's a lot of conifers to choose from. And uh, as Tom had mentioned, we need to use them to provide winter and uh, summer windbreaks uh, for our home areas, garden areas, orchards, ornamental plantings, wherever they may be. And I'm just going to talk about some the different groups of conifers in the state. This is just a non-technical uh, run through of some of the uh, some of the conifers that are commonly used in the state, and a few that are maybe could be used a little more. So the pines. There's two native uh, species of pine in North Dakota. I don't know if you guys knew that. Of course, in the western part of the state, we've got ponderosa pine and limber pine, both native to the area. Uh, Scotch pine from uh, Europe and Asia is used across the state, hardy across the state. And then we have some Asian and European white pine species that do very well here. And those are the what are called the stone pines. And I'll talk a little bit about those later. And then I just wanted to say the eastern white pine, which is native to Minnesota right next to us, is generally not adapted to uh, <coughs> North Dakota conditions. I usually do not see good examples of white pine in North Dakota. So I'm sure that they are out there in some places. Ponderosa pine, as I said, is native, uh, native to the western Dakotas, western Nebraska, clear out into central Nebraska. And it's the variety Scopulorum, which is very important to us. Um, Ponderosa pine probably has one of the largest native ranges of any conifers in the US. It goes from the west coast clear into the plain states. But we can't bring those sources from California and Oregon and Washington and even Idaho into this area and expect them to live. They are not hardy here. They have not, they have not evolved with the climate that we have here. So 
Our variety is variety Scopulorum, which is on the plains in the uh, front range of the Rockies, which is extremely hardy, uh, 30, 40 below, and, and adapts very well to our conditions. Needles are in twos and threes. The cones are kind of a little smaller than a fist size to about a fist size and, and end in a sharp, uh, sharp prickle on the end of it. So if you pick up a ponderosa pine cone, you can feel it as soon as you pick it up from the prickles on there. I put in my obligatory baby animal picture for everybody to see. So if you can pick the baby birds out there beside the cone. Uh, Ponderosa pines, I said, is very, uh, very adaptable to North Dakota uh, conditions. Very drought tolerant, very pH adaptable, which is important in North Dakota. We have high pHs here and uh, able to stand our winds and our winter sun on them, and, and they do fairly well. Um, mature height, depending on location, 35, 45, up to 65 feet generally, depending on the conditions that they're growing in. This is the other species that's native to North Dakota. It's called limber pine. This is actually a white pine species, and this is way out in uh, Bowman County in southwest North Dakota. It's in the southwest portions of three states in the plains, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. From there, it goes west into the uh, Intermountain region and, and occurs uh, in the foothills and up to very high elevations. It's called limber pine because you can take those branches and bend them clear to the ground. You can, in fact, you can almost tie them in knots, they're so limber. And so they uh, are not damaged by snow load on them. But they grow very well here. It's just not utilized in our area. Um, it's one of the uh, one of the trees that you don't generally go to a garden center and they have one in stock. You're gonna have to look for it a little bit, but they do very well. The the one in the picture is this one I grew from a seed. Uh, you know, some of these, or I grew several actually. Some of them are about 30 foot tall now, so they do very well here. Scotch pine is pretty commonly known to everybody across the state. Uh, we use the Northern European and Northern Asian seed sources. Um, as I said, Ponderosa pine is very widely distributed in North America. Scotch pine is very widely distributed in Europe and Asia. So again, there are certain sources that do best for us and those that do not do well for us. If you brought Scotch pine from Spain or France or some of those areas, they do not do well for us. If you take it from the uh, uh, northern areas across Europe, Russia, into Mongolia, some of those areas, those sources do very well for us. So again, it's pretty much source dependent, and most of the scotch pine sold in our area is adapted to our conditions. Uh, there's very short needles, a couple inches long, very small rounded cones, and it's got an orange exfoliating bark, which is kind of neat. And they, uh, they can get either as broad as tall in an open location or very tall and narrow um, in, a, uh, in a tighter situation you can see here. So sort of the ARS station in Mandan. And you can see how the bark exfoliates off those trees in, the, in that orange pattern. It's a very attractive uh, trait of the tree. Uh, a tree that is now gaining in popularity is Swiss mountain pine. Everybody's familiar with mugo pine, those little mounds that you kind of grow um, that look kind of actually unnatural. Well, this is, this is the tree form of mugo pine. This occurs in Europe at high altitudes and uh, anywhere up 15 to 30 foot in height, grown as a single stem tree, extremely cold hardy, uh, extremely adaptable to our dry soil conditions and winter winds. And uh, this is the cultivar Tannenbaum, and that is the cultivar that is now becoming available. And uh, this is a picture of a tree here in Fargo. Very little work that you need to do on it. So if you want something that looks like a Christmas tree out in your yard that's going to stay in place for the next 20, 30 years, then this is, this is one you can use. It's an interesting story behind this cultivar. Dr. Dale Herman was one of the first uh, researchers to get mugo pine seed from within its native range in Europe. He grew all these sources out when he was at South Dakota State and uh, a lot of variation and some of these had this very nice tree form and uh, actually this tree was named and, and selected after Dale left but he had a big part in actually um, the creation of this cultivar. There are actually other plantings of it in North Dakota. This is up at Minot and some trees that I think are even nicer than Tannenbaum. And again, again, these are some of Dale's work. And uh, 
The species Swiss mountain pine is available from nurseries. In fact, Kathy mentioned uh, Jeffrey's nursery in her talk. Jeffrey carries Swiss mountain pine, the seedling strains of it. So very, very nice tree pine that won't outgrow its uh, situation. I want to talk a little bit. The stone pines are virtually, not virtually, they're unknown in this part of the country. They're more widely used on the east and west coast. Uh, stone pines are kind of... Uh, the Asian uh, equivalent of what we would call pinyon pines in our country. They have an edible seed. They call them stones there. We call them seeds here. So it's an edible nut on them. Um, extremely attractive trees. They have high resistance to white pine blister rust, which is killing our native white pines across the country. White pine blister rust is another disease that was introduced uh, from Asia, which uh, our, our native white pines have no tolerance evolved to it, so it's, it's wiping out many of our native white pines. But the Asian species, since they evolved with the disease, have resistance. And they're, then they're very ornamental, extremely hold, uh, cold hardy to minus 50 with some of the species, highly resistant to winter needle sun burning. I've not seen any winter sun burning on, on some of the species we grow. There's Swiss stone pine, Siberian stone pine, Korean stone pine, and Japanese stone pine. And uh, I'm going to kind of just, the picture on your right here is of, of pine assembra, but they're called stone pines, as I said, because they uh, get the, these little wingless nuts inside. And those cones disintegrate. They don't open up and fall out. The cones disintegrate. They're ripped apart by, by uh, woodpeckers uh, and other uh, nut collectors. So hence the name stone pine. But uh, Swiss stone pine is extremely hardy. A number of cultivars available, one of which is from NDSU called Prairie Statesman. Uh, some others are Chalet, Blue Mound, and Glocka Compacta. So uh, very, very nice trees, beautiful foliage, five needles in a fascicle, blue-green foliage. This is the selection uh, from NDSU by Dr. Herman. Uh, this is the original tree out at Absaraca, and this year, 2015, it was named the uh, Collector Conifer of the Year. So one of the uh, conifer groups uh, liked it so well that this is the tr tree that they're promoting nationally this year. And it is, is uh, available in some of the local garden centers. It's being uh, produced uh, in greater and greater numbers by the Oregon wholesale nurseries now. Uh, I wanted to throw in Siberian stone pine. does very well here, slow growing. It's greener rather than blue green. It's much more green. Uh, very slow growth, doesn't overwhelm the landscape. It may get 30 to 35 foot. Reportedly hardy to minus 60, which I would hate to have to put a tree through minus 60, but it seems like anything with the name Siberian in it has a little bit of hardiness to it. Uh, some of the spruces, everybody's familiar with spruce. I think if you look at the conifers in about any town or city around North Dakota, probably three-quarters of the conifers planted in those towns are Colorado spruce. Um, Colorado spruce, because it's highly adaptable, it's very cold-hardy, it's very attractive. Uh, but as I say, it's our next overplanted species with increasing disease problems. There's a lot of diseases now occurring on Colorado spruce. Anytime you overplant a species in the numbers that we do, then the problems all start to catch up with it. Uh, down to, in South Dakota, to the south of us, southwest of us, in the Black Hills, there's a variety of white spruce called Black Hill spruce that's very well adapted to plains conditions. It's much less susceptible to some of those needle diseases. Norway spruce, generally not used in this area, but, but we do have a selection of it that does well here. And then a new spruce that's being tried here is a Chinese spruce uh, that's kind of being planted out in the... Uh, Northern Plains area called Meyer spruce, and we're trying to increase that spruce diversity, uh, have some others out there, and kind of cut down on that reliance of Colorado spruce so much. So again, at the Absaraco Hort Farm, we have a spruce collection. So if you're interested in spruce, come out this summer, and we can, we can send you to it, and you can look at a lot of spruce. There's a lot of variation between the species and the cultivars. Colorado spruce, as I said, is probably the most popular uh, spruce planted in the state. It looks best when they're grown, they're full form, separated from each other and allowed to branch to the ground. Uh, much too often we'll put 
three of them in a landscape, you know, six foot apart, and in 10 years they've all grown into each other, and they're covering the sidewalk or the front entrance, and then everybody starts hacking the branches off of them. So if you can get them out and let them be, that's their, their best best situation, and plus that provides a lot of air movement around in that foliage and less susceptibility to diseases. There is a whole mania which has come about with Colorado spruce. I don't know how many cultivars there are of Colorado spruce, but there are people that do nothing but collect Colorado spruce cultivars. And that's where the blue colors and the forms, these are just a couple of them that are fairly common and widely adaptable. Fat Albert is one of them. Um, I can't quite figure out why they call it Fat Albert because it's basically a little more compact form of Colorado spruce. You know what you're going to get with this. It, it may still get 30, 35 foot tall, but it, it's not going to be the size of an uh, overwhelmingly large Colorado spruce at, at 60 or 70 foot. Another one, a very blue foliage, is called Baby Blue Eyes, uh, becoming very popular. And these are just a few. If you Google Colorado spruce cultivars, you're going to get all kinds of plants. If you don't want the large plants, you can get the small plants, anywhere from several foot high up to about six or seven foot high. There are, there are many, many, many cultivars of Colorado spruce. And these are all grafted cultivars, and uh, so you can pretty much know what form they're going to be in the landscape. If you're into dwarf conifers, come out and see our collection. We have a lot of these. These are, these are some of the plants in our collection out at Absaraca. But too many of a good thing causes problems. Uh, as you go through anywhere, I, I think any town in North Dakota, you can drive around and see needle cast on spruce, uh, bare limbs on spruce, dead trees. <clears throat> we tend to plant them way too close together, and we plant way too many of them. Um, we, we like, you know, in, in the Midwest, we like our shelter belts that are the same species a half a mile long. And we, we need to not do that. We need to break these up with um, multiple conifer species, multiple deciduous species. Then you don't have this disease transmission right down the roads like we get. Uh, just a couple more shots, just, just shots around town and, and small towns around. You can really see the, the problems coming into uh, Colorado spruce. There's two needle cast diseases, rhizophera and stigmina. Uh, which causes the needle cast, and then we have a uh, branch and trunk fungus called Cytospora that kills whole limbs at a time. So there's a lot of things going on with Colorado spruce right now. Uh, Black Hill spruce, as I mentioned, native in the Black Hills of South Dakota. You drive through Spearfish Canyon down there, you see a lot of spruce in the canyon. Those are all Black Hill spruce. And that's basically a white spruce that's native to the north of us in uh, in Canada, which kind of got marooned as the climate changed and uh, became uh, warmer on the plains and less moisture, and so those black or the white spruce kind of remained in the Black Hills, where uh, conditions were a little more favorable for it, and it's changed over time to be a little more adapted to plains conditions too. Um, less susceptible to the needle cast diseases, they can still get rhizophera, but less susceptible, and, but. The big thing is people like blue spruce and color, or, uh, black hills are more green in color. So maybe we need to get, get used to a little green too. But shorter needles on it, uh, very small cones on it. Cones are only inch and a half, two inches long. So it's an attractive tree, very attractive tree. Meyer spruce, as I mentioned, is an Asian spruce, a northern Asian spruce, has not been grown much at all in the northern plains. Um, it's being trialed in a number of states. So far it's had good, very good cold hardiness, um, much better resistance to the needle cast diseases. So hopefully it has resistance to those and, and it won't cross into them. <clears throat> it's got blunt rather than sharp tipped needles. If you grab a, a Colorado spruce by the needles, you feel it right away in those uh, spines on the end of the needles. Meyer spruce, you can grab the needles. They're, they're soft, not soft, but much softer. They don't have a tip on the end of it and uh, don't end up hurting your hand. Height-wise, we don't know right now if, we, if it's going to be 30, 40, 50 foot. We just have not grown them enough. Um, you know, individual specimen, <coughs> excuse me, out in the open looks very similar to Colorado spruce. 
It's got longer cones, uh, longer than Black Hills, not quite as long as Colorado, but, uh, but very similar trees. Uh, Aaron Bergdahl with North Dakota Forest Service has an interest in Meyer spruce. This is a mixed planting down in Ransom County here, county here in North Dakota. And you can see there's uh, Black Hills on the uh, left and Myers on the right. Very similar growth rates, very similar habits. So hopefully that'll be a, a species that we can use a little bit more in the future. I mentioned Norway spruce. Norway spruce typically isn't used to a large degree in North Dakota. Uh, it's better adapted Minnesota, Wisconsin, and to the east. But uh, NDSU does have a, have a release or a selection and re release called Royal Splendor Norway Spruce. And this is very different from the typical Norway Spruce. This tree is much more upright, pyramidal form to it. Uh, all the branches are upright, shorter needles. It doesn't have the drooping branches of Norway. If you're familiar with Norway Spruce, they kind of get older. They have a drooping appearance. They look a little tired. But uh, the Royal Splendor Spruce does not do that. This has become very popular with um, the wholesale nurseries on the west coast. And uh, we go in every year to our tree with this lift. We go in and, and we take what are called scions from that tree. All these uh, cultiv our conifers that are cultivars are grafted. So we take hundreds of scions. Uh, and the scion is essentially the, the short end of that new growth. And that's what's grafted on rootstocks. So we'll send uh, several hundred to a number of nurseries. And they graft those grow them for a number of years to get them up to size, and then those are the trees that are distributed. There's a lot of odd spruce cultivars out there. So if you like something different in your yard, one of them that I'm, I'm starting to see show up is this uh, uh, pendula white spruce. It kind of has a wavy appearance with the weeping limbs on it. And the uh, red cone Norway, when the cones come out, they're on small plants even. They're producing little red cones on the end of it. And as I said, if you're interested in conifers and dwarf conifers, there are hundreds of them available that, that have some odd shape to them that are pretty distinct and neat if they're not overused in the landscape. Douglas fir is a tree that is just rare, very rarely encountered in North Dakota. Um, this is in a cemetery, a little town just west of Fargo, about 25 miles of uh, Wheatland, North Dakota, if you know where Wheatland is. North side of Wheatland, there's a little cemetery there. As you drive by, you look at the cemetery and you think, ah, oh, they've got it all planted with Colorado spruce. But actually, most of the trees in this cemetery are Douglas fir. Douglas fir does not do well here. The seed sources we've tried have not performed well here. Well, here we have a cemetery full of Douglas fir. These trees were sent to them as a mistake in 1949. Uh, the cemetery board ordered Colorado spruce from a nursery in Colorado. What they got instead was Douglas fir uh, by mistake, which is really a very uh, fortuitous mistake for us because we're now using this as a seed source um, to, to grow these plants. Uh, this source is, is very winter hardy. It's uh, adapted to the Northern Plains area. It is not susceptible to any of those spruce needle cast diseases. So here we have a whole different genera that hopefully we can grow. And it doesn't, we don't need to be concerned about the spruce needle cast diseases. Douglas fir does have some of its own problems, but there's not enough of them here to where any of those are, are occurring here right now. As I mentioned, these are, these are being grown there. Right now being con uh, grown as container seedlings by the Towner State Nursery. Itasca Nursery over in Minnesota is also, uh, will be growing this source. So there should be a number of seedlings of this source available. Very, very similar to uh, Colorado spruce in form, but not as blue. This is Colorado spruce uh, on the right, but then you've got three Douglas fir here on the left. So uh, growth rate and symmetry, very similar to Colorado spruce. Uh, we're probably asked about furs every year. What fur can we grow here? And we always say probably none. Um, furs do not do well here. And uh, they're just, we have two, two dry conditions, drying winds. They winter sunburn extremely badly. Uh, I always tell them if you're going to try to grow one here, place it on the north side of a, a belt or a home or something where the winter sun does not hit it. If you want to try it, the best choices are uh, 
probably Minnesota sources of balsam fir, which there are a few balsam fir around, and uh, trial of Siberian fir. This is typically what happens to fir in our part of the country. The, the needles are continuously burned on in open off in open locations. This is a little fir that I've been watching for a couple of years. This is the Siberian fir that I mentioned. Again, one of those plants from Siberia, hardy to minus 50, 60. But it has not shown much of that winter burn, especially as a young plant, that you get on, on plants right adjacent to it. And you can see all these other burned sources of balsam fir. So it's one we can maybe try. Siberian fir is produced by a number of growers. So maybe a fir we can try in, in our climate here. Arborvitae. Everybody, everybody wants to grow arborvitae, which is fine if you uh, realize that at some point you're going to get winter burn on the foliage. Um, it's, uh, it, they're very attractive plants. They're very dense. They're excellent for screening. Um, Thuia occidentalis is actually a native U.S. plant, but once we bring it out on the plains here, it starts getting some of those uh, winter sunburn problems. There are a number of cultivars, and I've, I've listed just the ones that are taller cultivars, anywhere from, uh, well, I went down to five foot, but most of these are above that. Some of these, I say 20 foot, uh, they can even get greater than this. This is out at Absaraca. They're probably pushing 26, 28 foot in this row. There are a number of cultivars with that columnar form, Brandon and Fastigiata, Skybound, Technine, Wariana. So they're all, uh, they are available at, at different nurseries, but uh, they are susceptible to winter burn. You want to water them in very well in the fall um, so that they have moisture. Here's what we generally see with Arborvita. It looks like a lot of little uh, Charlie Brown Halloween characters. People go out and cover them up each year to try to keep the sun off of them. Uh, the, the other big problem with it is deer brows, deer love Arborvita. And of course, the uh, winter sunburn problem on them. So, if you can put up with all of the problems and give them a good location, then then uh, you can probably keep them in good shape. Upright junipers. I'm not going to talk about any of the creeping junipers at all, but more of the upright forms. And uh, eastern red cedar, Rocky Mountain juniper, are both native to North Dakota. Eastern red, more in the eastern part, Rocky Mountain across central to the western part of the state. Both of them are very drought and cold tolerant, uh, soil pH adaptable. They grow on soil pH is well up into the mid eights. Uh, they're useful in mixed plantings, especially the upright ones or as a screen planting where you might use an arborvita. If you're worried about winter burn, you could try some of the upright junipers instead. Uh, they, they just aren't as susceptible to, to arborvita. So when you say that, I'm sure somebody has some on it, but, uh, uh, height 10 to 20 foot, width 3 to 8 foot on them. One of them uh, that's, that's gaining a lot in popularity is Taylor Eastern Red Cedar, uh, which is very, very tight, very columnar, extremely columnar. The Dora Juniper was found in the Badlands in North Dakota. There's another cultivar from the Badlands called Sky High, then several other cultivars, Call of Green and Wichita Blue. So there's a, there's a number of upright junipers that we can use in the landscape. Uh, I was going to throw larch in here at the end. There's a uh, uh, said um, conifers are generally evergreen, but that's not true with all conifers. Larch are a deciduous conifer. They lose their needles every year. And so they, they grow back in the spring, much like any other deciduous tree in our landscape. They have very soft, attractive foliage. They're very winter hardy, the Siberian and European. Uh, species, very pH adaptable, but they're not as drought tolerant as, as like some of the spruces or pines. Pyramidal in form, but you get cultivars that do everything that spruce do from weeping, vestigiate, and dwarf. So uh, the, the new growth, you can see the very soft new growth, spur type growth. They get the uh, purplish cones in the spring, and they make a, make a nice tree, very much like a spruce type form, actually. Uh, just over at the ARS station, very bright green color in the summer. And then, unfortunately, this was a cloudy day when I took this picture, but, uh, but uh, lemon yellow to gold in the fall. So very, very attractive tree that's really not used as much as it should be here. Uh, somebody told me, well, they lose their needles every year. 
and, and I said, well, yeah, they, they lose them every year, but they grow them back. If you can plant a Colorado spruce, it will lose its needles, and it won't grow them back. So, you know, larch is, overcomes some of that. So feel free to come out and visit us sometime. You can contact Dr. West or myself at these email addresses and, and pretty much on any conifers, deciduous trees you want to know about. So thank you very much. Okay, we do have time for a few questions out there. Well, Greg, you, you talked about larches. Would you recommend large trees for a windbreak? Large trees for a windbreak, uh, again, losing the needles in the winter so kind of negates some of that winter effect of the windbreak. If you wanted it for a, a summer effect, then certainly um, they would be fine for that. But maybe in a mixed windbreak where you've got uh, several conifer species and shrub species, they'd be fine for that. For windbreak. Worst evergreen. For windbreak. Well, no, then, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it gives you some wind protection, yeah. but surely not as much as other evergreens, as other conifers. I talk properly here. <laughs> How about, uh, Greg, what would be a good uh, ever, a conifer for a shelter belt that's along a river that occasionally floods? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Conifers generally are intolerant of flooding. Uh, some of the uh, arborvita may be a little more tolerant of uh, moist soils, but in our area, we really don't have the conifers that, that tolerate flooding that well. I guess I would plant other deciduous species. How about, um, okay, got a lot of larch love here. What's the difference between a European and a Siberian larch? Uh, European larch, uh, side by side, it, it's a little bit difference in the cones, a um, little bit difference in the hardiness with Siberian being a little hardier. Um, Siberian is a little more tolerant to some of the conditions that we have here. Very similar if you look at them side by side. I think it'd be hard to, to tell them apart for most people, but for a tougher site or a colder site, Siberian would be the nod over the European, I guess. Greg, should I rake the needles underneath my conifer every year? Raking needles under conifers drives me nuts. Um, I would rather see a bed under a conifer and let the needles fall and accumulate. They, those needles actually provide protection for that root system and moisture retention. I know a lot of people like to clean them all up each year, but, but I would just soon leave them lay and develop a bed underneath it. Um, how about, can I use an upright juniper as a substitute for an arborvitae, or are they just as susceptible to winter sunburn? Um, upright junipers are much less susceptible to winter sunburn. If you want to screen, uh, it depends on what part of the state you're in. In the uh, eastern part of the state, the eastern red cedar upright uh, cultivars like Taylor do better. Uh, as you move west, you can use Taylor once again, but but some of the uh, Rocky Mountain upright cultivars do better to the west of us than, than in this area with more humidity. But yeah, they can, be, they can be used on tougher sites than Arborvita and perform or the same function or provide just as nice a screen. How about red pines? What's your feeling about them? Red, red pine are not adapted to North Dakota. You occasionally find one. They're adapted to much, much lower pH soils and tend to winter sunburn very badly. Uh, it's a native timber tree to the east of us and should be left to the east of us. Okay, we'll do that. How about the, the stone pines grow as fast as the ponderosa pine? The growth rate on stone pines is much slower, which actually I prefer, so that it, they are a little more in tune with the landscape. Um, ponderosa pine can grow quite rapidly and uh, you can actually put a lot of candle growth out that will, so much candle growth that can break in a windstorm or by birds sitting on it. Uh, the stone pine don't put out that much growth each year. So growth rate is much less. Tough evergreen that can grow well in a very shallow, rocky soil. Any of the Rocky Mountain juniper cultivars, eastern red cedar cultivar, uh, ponderosa pine is native to those areas. 
Um, how close can you plant a conifer to the home foundation? Yeah, um, any of these I would I would move out from a foundation, uh, you know, at least six eight foot at a minimum. It depends on the conifer. A smaller conifer, you can get a little closer. Uh, as I mentioned, things like Colorado spruce, we tend to put too close. Uh, we quickly overwhelm the planting site. They're probably concerned about roots against the foundation. I don't know that the conifers are going to be as as uh, heavy a root system into a foundation, but just getting them away from the house is the best thing. Do you have any experience with a weeping Norway spruce, or is that a sad story? Uh, <laughs> Yes, weeping Norways are very sad. No, there are weeping cultivars of Norway, and uh, there are actually uh, several that do fairly well here. There are some small ones that only get mid-range size, and then larger ones, and, and they tend to do pretty well. What do you think about uh, growing these stone pine trees and harvesting the pine nuts? That would be great if you've got about 30, 40 years to wait. Okay. <laughs> they do take a long time to reach reproductive maturity. Okay, doesn't sound like a plan. How about did the Meyer spruce handle the winter burn conditions and the drought? We uh, well, Meyer spruce to this point, and you know this is only with ten years of looking at them, have done very well with minimal winter burning, and then that's one of those things. As we get more of them out in plantings, we'll be able to determine that. At this point, they look good though. They don't appear to be as drought tolerant uh, side by side maybe as Colorado spruce if you needed more drought tolerance. But any spruce really shouldn't be in that extreme droughty situation. You know, getting back to those pine nuts, we got a lot of nuts out there. And they're wondering, do they taste as good as a pinion nut? You ever had a stone nut? I have. Uh, they do. They The typical pine nut taste. And uh, oftentimes, uh, especially stores, you can buy buy uh, um, Siberian stone pine nuts. The limber pine in the southeast part or southwest part of North Dakota is also a small nut producing pine, and and they taste the same too. Okay, um, I see uh, a conifer from a distance that looks almost black. What is it? It's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this day or night? <laughs> uh, okay, how about this? Uh, when's a good time to uh, remove a uh, conifer branch? A, a branch? It really doesn't matter on, on the conifers. If it's bothering you right now, then go out and remove it. The saw is sharp and the body is willing. Yes. Okay. The snow has melted. Okay. Any, yeah. Any last question? Oh, sorry. Oh. You know, for that arborvitae, it's, it's winter burn. It's a uh, winter burn sensitive. Should we cover that with burlap over winter? What do you think about you that? Can, it, yeah, the burlap on arborvitae. If you want to go to the to the work of doing it each year, a lot of people do. Um, they do cover them. That, that works so far until they gradually get too large to do it. But instead of wrapping it tightly, kind of just more loosely around it, or put stakes in before the ground freezes and wrap kind of a, just a protective layer around those stakes instead of tying up your tree like it's going to get away or something. Yes, yeah, you know, that's why arborvitae really suffer from the winter winds. Okay, Greg, my ponderosa pine's got holes in the trunk. What's going on? Yep. What do you get? Sap suckers. Sap suckers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. Sap suckers or woodpeckers. What are we going to do about it? Uh, nothing. That's right. You know, if it becomes extremely bad, then you've got, you've got some sort of larva underneath there that the woodpeckers are going for, and you may need to have it looked at at that point. But there's occasional holes in it. That's typical. Stop that if you can, though, right, because it can girdle the tree. If, yeah, if it's, if it's severe. But, you know, oh. fight, just fight back, huh? just scare the woodpecker so it moves to the neighbor's <laughs> tree. That's what I recommend. Um, there's a, a lot of questions about that Ad Sirac, uh field tour. Do you know, like, 
Do you know the date by any chance? Or uh, don't have a date for this year. It's generally in August. We would like to have it in September, but it will be again. And usually we let the extension offices know and and try to get it out through the system. But one tour per year. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Unless you've got a group that wants to come out, and we'll certainly do a tour for you. So if you've got a if you've got a, if you've got a master gardener group or a 4-H group or Whatever group that you may have, certainly Todd or I will meet you out, out there and, and show you the area and let you loose after we talk about it a little bit. And, and you can spend the whole day out there easily <coughs> just walking around, looking at trees. Okay, I'm trying to make a plan. Okay, uh, 